to a powerful eruption in space. The Earth's atmosphere has been affected by the sun, unleashing its strongest flare in four years. These pictures show the aurora borealis, or northern lights, as seen from near northern Norway. The solar flares excited the gas particles, making them glow even more brightly. But beyond the great views, NASA warns the eruption could disrupt electrical power grids and satellite communication over the next few days. And far from Earth, the sun is putting on quite a show of its own. But could this solar storm end up short-circuiting some of our favorite devices? Okay, let's talk about those solar flares. They look incredibly pretty. What are they doing to communications here on Earth? Well, for about 10 years, the sun has been unusually quiet. Now it's beginning to wake up, as we see in dramatic fashion. And each one of those flares are as big as the Earth itself. And th th they release uh, explosions of a trillion times the power of, a, of an atomic bomb. And they make their way all the way across the Earth. So you can imagine it's quite a powerful thing that's going on. Now, the worry is that it could knock out satellites, power grids. That's a worry that every time this kind of thing and happens. How, how often does it happen? I mean, if you look at those flares, they look so tiny in our picture there. But you're saying those it's are because as big the sun's so big. That's right. big. And this happens often, Palo? Well, it, 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 the sun goes through cycles of activity. It's been through an unusually quiet phase at the moment, and some people think that it might go through an unusually hectic phase uh, later. So it can happen every two or three years. And because we've got so much satellite technology now, far more than ever before, we've got to be on our guard. Uh, if they're given enough notice, companies can shut down their satellites or get them into quiet mode while the storm passes. So and how long can a storm like this go on for? It generally lasts a few days, but the good news with this storm is that it's not as powerful as some. So hopefully the lights will stay on and uh, people will still be able to uh, tune into their TVs. Well, if nothing else, it looks absolutely spectacular. Palo, thanks very much for coming Pleasure. in. In outer space, in the next few weeks, a spacecraft will enter orbit around the planet Mercury for the very first time. It's a delicate task due to the searing heat, but researchers are excited about the treasure trove of data which they may receive. Right now, the team behind the project is busy trying to set the craft's final coordinates, and our science correspondent, Palab Ghosh, got an inside look at mission control. Main engine start, two, one and zero and liftoff of Messenger on NASA's mission to Mercury. In 2004, the Messenger spacecraft set off to explore one of the most mysterious worlds in our solar system, the planet Mercury. It's visiting a world that's closer to the sun than any other, with temperatures rising to a blistering 400 degrees centigrade. Part of the challenge has been to build a spacecraft that won't melt when it reaches its destination. Well, we had to design a thermal protection system, uh, and we came up with this uh, sunshade, which uh, is very, very thin. It's uh, uh, almost wafer thin, uh, and it keeps the temperatures on the outside of the spacecraft on the order of about 600 degrees Fahrenheit, but keeps the instruments inside and electronics inside at about room temperature. In Washington, researchers are uploading the final command codes to slow the spacecraft down. If they get this part wrong, the probe will either crash into the planet will spin off into outer space. This is the mission control center for the messenger spacecraft. There's some tension here because flight engineers are making the final preparations for the probe to enter orbit. It's the first time that a spacecraft will have been so close for so long around the planet Mercury. In the next few weeks, the probe will fire its retro rockets and enter orbit. And then messenger will begin to build up a detailed picture of the planet. Already the spacecraft has sent back these photographs, which show its complex surface in unprecedented detail. What you can learn when you're in orbit is so different than when you're just flying by and kind of snapping data and gathering data as you go. This is really going to revolutionize what we know about this planet. Researchers believe that by studying Mercury, they'll gain new insights into how our own planet and the other worlds in our solar system were formed. Palab Ghosh. BBC News, Washington. For more on the significance of this mission and what scientists hope to learn, I spoke to theoretical physicist Michio Kaku, author of Physics of the Future, from New York. Michio Kaku, we know that Mercury is small, dense and hot. What else do you think Messenger's journey might be able to tell us about this planet? Well, first of all, back in the 1970s, the Mariner spacecraft only photographed 45% of the surface. This time, we're going to have a complete 
a complete readout of the entire surface of Mercury, and we're going to be able to answer mysteries about that planet. For example, it apparently has ice on its polar ice caps. Who would have thought that one of the hottest planets in the solar system has ice caps? Plus, it's been shrinking. It shrunk perhaps a mile over several billion years because it's been cooling off. And most important, it may say something about the Earth. That is, why do we have a magnetic field? Mercury has an unusually large magnetic field, and we don't really know why. But what will this information tell us about the solar system? Well, first of all, take a look at the Earth. Our magnetic field has actually decreased by 10% over the last 150 years. And in fact, in the next several centuries to millennia, it may go to zero. And after that, it may actually flip. And we don't know why. It's quite embarrassing for a physicist. But we don't really understand the magnetic fields of the various planets of the solar system. And that protects the Earth from cosmic rays and solar flares. We need our magnetic field. Mercury has an unusually large magnetic field, about 1% that of the Earth, which is quite large for a planet of that tiny size. And it may give us clues as to why the Earth has its magnetic field. Now, if there is ice on Mercury, that means there's water there. So could there perhaps be life on Mercury? Well, I doubt it. Uh, Mercury and Venus are some of the hottest planets in the solar system. Uh, Venus, for example, is about 900 degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than the melting point of tin and many metals. So if you were to walk on the surface of Venus, for example, the surface would be largely molten. So I kind of doubt there would be any life as we know it on Mercury. But it's fascinating to realize that you could have these bizarre anomalies like ice on Mercury somewhere so hot. Now, after Mercury, where will NASA go next in its exploration of space, do you think? Uh, well, Pluto is going to be a, what, with the, uh, an object that's no longer considered a planet, but it's going to be uh, the object of quite a bit of exploration for NASA. So, on one hand, we're going toward Mercury, the closest planet toward the Sun, and then we're also going out to Pluto, which in some sense is an overgrown comet, it's not really a planet anymore, but we do want to find out more about the mysteries of these two extremes of our solar system. Michio Kaku, thank you for taking us on that journey through space. Mm -hmm. From Mercury to matrimony, the invitations are out and now the wait is on for 1,900 people who've been asked to attend the royal wedding of Prince William and Kate Middleton this April.